This now is the 33rd study period of the British Columbian Camp 1984, a 10 o'clock presentation on Sabbath morning, the first day of September 1984. We'll turn back now to Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 18 to pick up the thread that we were, we were pursuing last night in the brief presentation of the salvation of children, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 18. I promised you we'd look into the meaning of the expression signs and wonders in Israel. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 18 Behold, I am the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. When Christ was down here upon this earth, the Pharisees were persistently calling for Christ to give them a sign, some evidence of his divine origin and his sacred mission. And of course, um, the facts are no matter how great a sign he gave them, they still remained unbelievers. And Christ said to them that a wicked and an adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign should be given them except the sign of the Son of Man or, or, or Jonah. On page 407 there's a very interesting comment on this uh, interchange between Christ and the Pharisees and scribes and so forth. When the message of truth is presented in our day, there are many who, like the Jews, say, or Christ, show us a sign, work us a miracle. During the week, of course, we may comment, among, comment upon the fact that it is a natural human fail failing to go through the procedures and then sit back and wait for visible evidences that God has heard our prayer. We need to overcome that uh, human tendency and simply believe on the basis of God's word and God's word alone. For instance, in Romans 10 verse 17, we're told that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and the only basis for faith is the word of God. We believe it because God says it and so that's why I said that in, Christ, I mean, in Steps to Christ, page 51, it is so if you believe it. We have to say, I believe it, not because I feel it or because I see it, but because God has promised. Now Christ, reading again from page 407, Christ wrought no miracle at the demand of the Pharisees. He wrought no miracle in the wilderness in answer to Satan's insinuations. He does not impart to us power to vindicate ourselves or to satisfy the demands of unbelief and pride. But, even despite all those facts, but the gospel is not without a sign of its divine origin. Is it not a miracle that we can break from the bondage of Satan? Enmity against Satan is not natural to the human heart. It is implanted by the grace of God. When one who has been controlled by a stubborn wayward will is set free and yields himself wholeheartedly to the drawing of God's heavenly agencies, a miracle is wrought. So also when a man who has been under strong delusion comes to understand moral truth, every time a soul is converted and learns to love God and keep his commandments, the promise of God is fulfilled, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. The change in human hearts, the transformation of human characters is a miracle that reveals an ever-living Saviour working to rescue souls. A consistent life in Christ is a great miracle. In the preaching of the Word of God, the sign that should be manifest now and always is the presence of the Holy Spirit to make the Word a regenerating power to those who hear. This is God's witness before the world to the divine mission of his son the most important part of this paragraph are the last four or five lines which I'd like to now study in more detail first of all we're told the change in human hearts the transformation of human characters is a miracle that reveals an ever loving ever living saviour working to rescue souls now miracle is a sign and a wonder the actual words in Isaiah 8 and verse 18 are just that, signs and for wonders in, the, uh, in Israel. <clears throat> and so Sister White says, in the preaching of the word of God, 
And of course there's much preaching of the word of God these days. Every church upon the face of the earth that calls itself in any way a Christian church uses the Bible for its basis of uh, preaching and presentations. Now, but in the true preaching of the word of God, the sign that should be manifest now and always is the presence of the Holy Spirit to make the word a regenerating power to those who hear. This is God's witness or God's sign before the world to the divine mission of his Son. Now, when the word of God becomes a regenerating power, it then becomes the power whereby there is implanted in the individual a new life in the place of the old. <clears throat> And when that miracle takes place, then the sign and the wonder has been established. Now, let's not confuse this, of course, with a changed mental attitude or different interests, different objectives, different goals, different allegiances. All those things should be there, of course. But <clears throat> they can also be there without having in us the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. A foolish virgin, for instance, goes forth to meet the bridegroom. The foolish virgin has the lamp, which is the Bible, and the light, which is the illumination of truth. He has a certain amount of oil, which is the ministration of the Holy Spirit. But as we read the other day, he does not have in himself the regenerative work of the Spirit of God. He has not fallen upon the rock and been broken. His old nature is still there. So... We're not to rest content with um, church membership or group membership or belief in the message theoretically. We're not to be content with uh, the disposition to work ardently for its promotion. We must ask ourselves the question, has the hearing of the word of God produced in me a regeneration of life? If it has, then the sign and the wonder is there. If it has not, the sign and the wonder is missing. Tragically, of course, all too many people are self-deceived by their good works and believe that Ishmael is in, fact, uh, is in fact Isaac. Let's turn to Isaiah 55 a moment because here is a very beautiful presentation of these same lovely principles as contained in God's Word of Truth. Isaiah chapter 55. I run to the entire chapter and do it rather quickly this morning because uh, in this way alone can we really understand what uh, the last verse is saying. In the last verse we should read first. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree and it shall be to the Lord for a name for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Let's go back now to read the lead up to this particular statement, an everlasting sign. The first verse says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come you to the waters, and he who has no money, come you buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labour for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat you that which is good, and let your soul delight, delight itself in fatness. This is the same as the appeal made to the Laodicean church where God says to come, buy of him gold tried in the fire, white raiment and precious eye sell. And the Lord speaks to those alone who are thirsty and therefore know that they are thirsty. We've made the point during the week of course unless the Holy Spirit is working upon a person's heart it is pointless for us to seek to generate in them a spiritual response. It just doesn't work. And God goes to the thirsty and offers them water, which of course is the water of life. Reminds, reminds, reminds us of the verse in Matthew, the fifth chapter. Blessed are they who wish to hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be abundantly satisfied. I, the normal translation says they shall be filled, but the other says they shall be abundantly satisfied. Then God asks the question in verse 2, Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labour for that which satisfieth not? Now during this week, we've heard quite a few expressions from different people describing their experience back in the churches in which they came, expressions which describe years of study and hard labour in this field, 
and in return they found that which was not satisfying. And this of course is always going to be the case where the real truth is not found. And back in the days of uh, the Jews of course when ceremonialism had taken the place of the real truth the Jews came to the temple but they did not get spiritual satisfaction and the Lord says well why do you go on doing that when here is nourishing bread and satisfying water come and hearken diligently unto me and eat you that which is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness I love that last sentence because God does not wish us to be a lean uh, poverty stricken people particularly of course in the spiritual realm this reminds me of a statement in the book uh, Desire of Ages which I am challenged by we know of course that God's people have generally speak speaking been a poor people and uh, regarded by the world as being unfit for uh, recognition and such like but it should never have been that way page 28 in the book Desire of Ages had Israel been true to God he could have accomplished his purpose through their honour and exaltation if they walked in the ways of obedience he would have made them high above all nations which he has made in praise and in name and in honour all people of the earth said Moses shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you the nations which hear all these statutes shall say surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people but because of their unfaithfulness the God's purpose could be wrought out only through continued adversity and humiliation and that makes sense when you think about it why should the wicked be the rich people in the world why should they be the ones endowed with all these material treasures and so forth while God's folk have to make ends meet to carry his work on it just doesn't make sense and God did plan that Israel should have been the richest and most powerful nation upon the face of the earth coming behind in nothing the highest in intellectual achievements and technological advances and so forth but the tragedy was Israel could not handle that kind of prosperity and made them self-sufficient and made them proud now we have the choice today of going to the kingdom well established with um, material and spiritual riches but only if we learn to handle that and not to become proud and self-assertive thereby and so God desires us to rejoice in fatness and not to be a poor poverty stricken people he said rejoice yourself in fatness now or delight yourself in fatness rather now I know if I was to ask the question of this audience this morning which, which way would you rather go to heaven witnessing to righteousness as a rich person I don't mean fabulous to rich but rich enough or would you rather go there poverty stricken and the answer of course is self, self, self evident I know which I'd rather be verse 3 incline your ear and come unto me and hear and your soul shall live and I'll make an everlasting covenant with you even the sure message of David behold I have given him for a witness to the people a leader and a commander to the people behold thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not and nation that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Holy One because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel for he hath glorified thee seek your Lord while he may be found call you upon him while he is near let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon in this context we're told that God's ways and thoughts are much higher than ours and uh, we could develop this of course quite <coughs> extensively but in this context of course it means that God is not out to punish he is out to heal and to restore that's, that's his objective right down the line but then we come to the main part of the chapter with which I am concerned verse 10 down to verse 13 for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thither but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth in buds and may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater so shall my word be now let's go back and look at what that verse we have just read says we recognize that when the rain comes down it does accomplish the purpose for which God sent it absolutely now in various parts of the earth including Australia 
We have droughts from time to time. We've been very fortunate over the past two or three years. Been been good weather and good rainfalls down there. But, but about a decade ago, in Victoria, there was, a, I think, a drought lasting well over 18 months toward two years. And I saw pictures in the magazines and newspapers of the countryside. There was absolutely destitute of any trace of herbage whatsoever. Every green blade of grass was gone, and for the most part, the surface of the earth was mere dust, and the sheep were dying by their thousands, and so were the cattle and horses. And some farmers walked off their land forever, never to go back, because they were completely bankrupt and couldn't carry on. Then the time finally came when the clouds rolled up and the rain began to fall. Now, I didn't see farmers running around biting their fingernails and saying, I wonder, I wonder if the grass will grow. They knew it would grow. They knew it. As surely as that rain came down, the grass comes up. Isn't that right? Provided the seed in the ground, of course. Now, that certainty is so well known to us all that God desires to see in that certainty another certainty. And the other certainty is that in the gospel field, the same assurance is there. And so it says in verse 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. God's word will prosper in the thing whereunto he sent it. Now for what purpose does God, has God sent his word into the world? For what purpose? For the, to transform human souls, right? To regenerate humanity to put back into dying men, men and women the living presence of Jesus Christ. That is what God sent his word into this world to do. And he says, As surely as the rain comes down and the grass comes up, so shall my word be. It shall not return empty. It shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. And that is good news, is it not? Amen. That's glad tidings. Verse 12. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, instead of the brass shall come up the myrtle tree. And we understand, of course, that this is a spiritual application, that the Lord is not concerned here with the fruitfulness of the physical earth, although that would be certainly a very definite byproduct of this, uh, of this thing. There's a definite relationship between this earth's uh, prosperity and this plant and vegetable life and the presence of God in the people who inhabit the land or the absence of that presence. For instance, when Israel first went to Palestine, how did they find it? They had a land flowing with milk and honey. What is it today? It's virtually a desert. It's a very desolate place as the land of Israel. And this has come about, of course, because of the curse resting upon them because of the rejection and crucifying of Jesus Christ and their abandonment of the law of God but this text is not so concerned not so much concerned about the literal uh, coming forth of the myrtle and the what was the other tree the fir the fir and the myrtle tree in place of the thorn and the briar but this is talking in the spiritual sense now what does the thorn bush represent in the spiritual sense the old sinful nature, the sin master, and so does the briar. And the fir tree and the myrtle tree in this case obviously represent the new life in Christ Jesus. So here we're told that when people respond to God's appeals to come and buy real bread and drink real water, and as a result of this, the word of God accomplishes God's purpose in the receivers of that bread and water, that in those persons the thorn bush, which is the old man, is replaced by the fir tree which is the new man and it shall be to the Lord for name for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. In other words, the sign is the work of God's regenerating power. So, coming back to Isaiah 8 and verse 18, when the Lord says that we shall say as parents, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are, are these children are for signs and for wonders in Israel, then what's it saying about those children? They have been regenerated. In them has been placed the beautiful presence of the life of Jesus Christ. The divine seed has been implanted in them and that divine seed has sprung up into everlasting life. And nothing less than that can be a sign of the wonder. 
So if then when you bring your children to Jesus, as it is our privilege to do day by day, and especially of course finally in the great judgment day to bring our beautiful children to him, we'll bring them as signs and wonders only if we have effected their specific salvation from sin. Only if in them has been implanted the divine nature, only if the parents' ministration of the word of God has resulted in that word being a regenerating power in the hearts and minds of the children. Nothing less than that will meet that requirement. Now I don't have with me the little book Sons and Daughters of God, but in the first three or four days, it's a morning watch book of God, you got it there, thanks, wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> the Lord does provide, doesn't he? Now in the um, readings for May of that year, whenever it was, that, that's not important of course, it's the book Sons and Daughters of God, page 128 to page 130. We read now some uh, very beautiful and encouraging statements in regard to the witness of Jesus Christ as to what our children are to be. Before I read them, I'd like to make this point that when it comes to the question of what is acceptable child behaviour, we find that there's a wide disparity of thought in this field. We find one parent, for instance, permitting the child to do something, another parent will not permit the child to do that very same thing. Some parents expect certain patterns of behaviour, even, even though they might not achieve them, others are content to a much lesser level of behaviour. And what is needed then is one reliable standard to establish before us what is acceptable child behaviour and Jesus Christ is that pattern. And everyone then who learns to say the life of Christ as a baby, as a child, as a boy and as a youth will learn from that what we are to expect from our children when they are truly born again and properly trained. So I read on page 128 Jesus is the perfect pattern and it is the duty and privilege of every child and youth to copy the pattern. Now when I read the statement Jesus is the perfect pattern remember in the past we have studied that, that thought mainly from the point of view of Christ's adulthood from his, the beginning of his ministry to his crucifixion that has been the period of Christ's life which we have spent time studying as the pattern we have not, I think you'll agree, gone back and considered the babyhood of Jesus, the boyhood of Jesus and the youth of Jesus Christ. That's been a neglected field of study, which of course is rather unfortunate. And now we emphasise the point that Jesus Christ is the perfect pattern, not simply in his adulthood, but also in his infancy, his childhood, his boyhood, his youth and his young manhood right up until the age of 30, as well as, of course, beyond that, until the crucifixion during which time he was the pattern to parents as well. I read further on. Let children bear in mind that the child Jesus had taken upon himself human nature and was in the likeness of sinful flesh and was tempted of Satan as all children are tempted. Now this means then, if we turn to 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, which uh, contains this very, very glorious promise, to say the least of it. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Now we had also read that, of course, and uh, to whom have you confined that promise in your mind? To adults. But on the same page, a little further down, it says, and I'll read this again in a moment or two, God's promise is given as much to children and youth as to those of more mature age. Whenever God has given a promise, let the children and youth turn it into a petition and beg the Lord to do those things for them and their experience that he did for Jesus, his only begotten son, when in human necessity he looked to God asking for the thing which he needed. Now, is the promise in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 then confined only to intelligent uh, adults who are able to make decisions for themselves? No, it's not. It is just as much for the tiniest babe as it is for the oldest saint. 
And so therefore, no temptation can come to your child, but such as is common to man, and which man? The man Christ Jesus. In other words, every temptation that any child can ever face today as a child, Christ himself faced as a child. And every temptation that any boy or girl can face today, Christ faced as a boy. It was common to him. And every temptation which the youth can know today was known by Christ as a youth. And therefore, it, that your temptation is, is a common temptation. It's not something that is special and unique to you alone. I hope you don't mind not being unique, but uh, in this case it's a good thing, of course, to know that every temptation has been faced by Jesus Christ it is common to that man, that youth, that boy, that child, and that babe. And just as God is faithful in that he will not suffer you as a parent or as an adult to be tempted by what you're able, so God will not suffer any child, any baby, any boy or girl to be tempted above that which he is able to bear. And so Sister White says, coming back to page 128, all, Jesus Christ was tempted of Satan as all children are tempted. He was able to resist the temptation of Satan through his dependence upon the, upon the divine power of his heavenly Father as he was subject to his will and obedient to all his commands. He kept his father's statutes, precepts and laws. He was continually seeking counsel of God and was obedient to his will. It is the duty and privilege of every child to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. It will please the Lord Jesus to, to have the children ask him for every spiritual grace, to bring all their perplexities and trials to the Saviour, for he knows how to help the children and youth because he was a child himself and was one subject to all the trials, disappointments and perplexities to which children, children use the subject. Now I'll read again what I read before. God's promise is given as much to children and youth as to those of more mature age. Whenever God has given a promise, let the children and youth turn it into a petition and beg the Lord to do those things for them and their experience he did for Jesus, his only begotten son, when in human necessity he looked to God asking for the things which he needed. Every blessing the Father has provided for those of more mature experience has been provided for children and youth through Jesus Christ. Every experience. Now what's the most important experience God has provided for those of more mature, mature experience? New right, the new birth, being born again. That's the most important blessing of all. And the plain statement says that every blessing the Father has provided for those of more mature experience has been provided for children and youth through Jesus Christ. Therefore the promise is that... Uh, children are to receive the blessing of the new birth along with all the other blessings which come thereafter. Now, I want to get a short time to uh, go through the service. I won't read the next two pages but you can read them in your own spare time if you will. Now then, I'd like now to demonstrate that um, from the, we'll spend just a little time in the study of the life of Christ as a child or as a baby, a child and a youth to see how perfectly sinless Jesus Christ maintained his relationship to God during that period. I turn now to that remarkable chapter called Days of Conflict across to page 88 and this is talking not about Christ as the man but Christ as the babe and the boy and the youth. It says, of the bitterness that falls to the lot of humanity there was no part which Christ did not taste. There were those who tried to cast contempt upon him because of his birth and even in his childhood he had to meet their scornful looks and evil whisperings. Even in his childhood. Now note this next sentence. If he, that is as a child, and I'll just add those words in, had responded by an impatient word or look, if he conceded to his brothers by even one wrong act, he would have failed to be a perfect example. Thus he would have failed of carrying out the plan, of, plan for our redemption had he even admitted that there could be an excuse for sin. Satan would have triumphed and the world would have been lost. This is why the tempter worked so hard to make his life as trying as possible that he might be led to sin. Now doesn't this sound incredible that a child, a little boy, um, we don't, we're not given ages here but uh, and the chapter comes after the chapter of the Passover visit but 
it seems to be it seems to span time both before and after the Passover visit when Christ was twelve years of age. But even at twelve years of age, if at that if at that tender inexperienced point of time he considered by just one impatient word or one impatient look, that's all, then the plan of salvation would have been broken. Now when we think about our children today, who have not of course up until this time um, well up until recently I should better say no doubt received the blessings of this kind of education that Christ had how far would the plan of salvation survive if our children had to be like Jesus was in order to preserve it namely totally sinless not even by one impatient word to look to sin against God we know of course the rather sober answer to that question let's go back then and briefly look at some of the main points in the life of Jesus Christ as a child and then we'll talk in practical terms as to how our children can likewise enjoy the same blessings and manifest the same excellence of character. Page 68. Now this must be, of course, a much briefer presentation than will be given at the Californian camp in a few days' time. As a child, Jesus manifests a peculiar loveliness of disposition. His willing hands were ever ready to serve others. He manifested the, manifested the patience that nothing could disturb and a truthfulness which would never sacrifice integrity. In principle, firm as a rock, his life revealed the grace of unselfish courtesy. That was the baby Jesus, the child Jesus, the youth and the young man. Now think about this. Christ had a, had a peculiar loveliness of disposition as a child and as a child he had a patience which nothing could disturb, nothing at all. And a truthfulness that would never sacrifice integrity. Now does God today accept anything or expect anything less than that from our children? No, he doesn't. It may sound like an insurmountable uh, level of attainment, but when, of course, the proper principles are applied, these levels can be quite readily reached as they were in the experience of Jesus. After all said and done, in this old world of sin, who is the more powerful, God or Satan? God is. Which is the more powerful, righteousness or sin? Again, we know it's righteousness. So in view of the fact, if we, if we are prepared to admit or believe that our children, let alone ourselves, of course, if our children cannot experience these things and have in them a patience which nothing can disturb and a truthfulness that will never sacrifice integrity, if we feel that well, our children, children are different and we can't expect this of them, then we are saying that sin is stronger than righteousness and Satan is stronger than God. And that's a very terrible implication to uphold. Being a little further, with deep earnestness, the mother of Jesus watched the unfolding of his powers and beheld the impress of perfection upon his character. With delight she sought to encourage that bright receptive mind. Through the Holy Spirit she received wisdom to cooperate with the heavenly agencies in the develop development of this child who could claim only God as his father. At this point I'd like to run across to page 512 in the book Desire of Ages to insert a thought here, building upon what was said last night in the study period then. 512, I think it is, in the uh, book uh, Desire of Ages. Now I made the point last night that um, the child is saved by faith and it's the faith in which it participates from its parents. When the parents have faith, the child also has faith. And that's borne out by the statement from page 512 in Desire of Ages where it says, If we will live in communion with God now the person who lives in communion with God who lives that way does he have faith or doesn't he have faith he has powerful faith living vital faith that's alive every single day now if we will do that we too may expect the divine spirit to mould our little ones even from their earliest moments in other words the earliest moments of the child of course begin right back with conception and the Holy Spirit will mould our little ones right from back there if we will live in communion with God. Spending time every day in the study of God's Word, building faith, building peace, building security. And as we do so, of course, as a parent experiences those things, a child experiences them with the mother 
and with the Father. And we can therefore rest assured the child will emerge in this world a very contented, very happy, very secure and very righteous little infant manifesting the same beautiful spirit that Jesus Christ had and walking and obeying as he walked and obeyed. Now we pass across to page 70 and I read these words, The child Jesus did not receive instruction in the synagogue schools. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets he learned of heavenly things. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel were now he was now taught at his mother's knee. As he advanced from childhood to youth, he did not seek the schools of the rabbis. He needed not the education to be obtained from such sources, for God was his instructor. I'd like to say more about God being the instructor a little later, but keep it in mind until we get to it a little, a little bit further on in the study period. Now then, the next paragraph talks about the way in which Jesus Christ gained from the word of God and the study of God's creative works concepts and principles that, that kept him steadfast and true in the battle against temptation. Both were books that were open to him, much more so than were even to his own parents and especially so in regard to the Pharisees and scribes around about him. And then Sister White says, Thus to Jesus the significance, the significance of the word and the works of God was unfolded as he was trying to understand the reason of things. Heavenly beings were his attendants and the culture of holy thoughts and communities was his. From the first dawning of intelligence he was constantly growing in spiritual grace and the knowledge of the truth. Now I don't know if I can find the statement too quickly here in um, the book Education but Sister White says, and I used to wonder about this, that Christ could, when he was here upon this earth, have opened up to the minds of his generation tremendous scientific discoveries, marvellous things that they knew nothing about back in those days. I'm not just sure where it is at the moment. Uh, it's a long time since I read that statement and so I've lost track of it just now. Um, but he didn't do that. Instead, of course, he concentrated upon teaching them the gospel. Now, where did Jesus Christ learn those marvellous scientific principles? Not from the schools of the rabbis, but from the word of God and from the study of the book of nature. And um, these are the things which, which opened up to his mind those great truths. I might find them during the interval and read it to you a little later. And I used to wonder how or where Jesus Christ got those things from. And I concluded erroneously many, many years ago that he was especially endowed with that by virtue of the fact that he was created God down here in human flesh. But Jesus Christ emptied himself of all that pre-knowledge or a scientific understanding and therefore under the Holy Spirit's teaching as a boy uh, and later as a youth he must have read those things in the book of nature and seen scientific mysteries there that to, even today have not yet been fully discovered. Now then, <clears throat> next paragraph says every child may gain knowledge as Jesus did. Every child may gain knowledge as Jesus did. Now, Jesus Christ became a very, very powerful person when it came to knowledge. At the age of 12, he was more than a match for the combined weight of all the intelligence and education of the Jewish leaders of that time. He was able to answer questions they couldn't even answer and to pose questions they hadn't even thought about. And he opened to their minds on that occasion many great truths and mysteries which, if followed up, would have led to a great revival reformation amongst the Israelites. And likewise, our children can be the head and not the tail in the advancing fields of knowledge. And the promise is that as we try to become acquainted with our Heavenly Father through His Word, angels will draw near, our minds will be strengthened, our characters will be elevated and refined, we shall become more like our Saviour. And as we behold the beautiful and grand in nature, our affections go out after God, while the Spirit is awed, the soul is invigorated by coming in contact with the infant through His works. Communion with God through prayer develops the mental and moral faculties and the spiritual power is strengthened as we cultivate thoughts upon spiritual things. Now moving on, we come to the chapter entitled Days of Conflict and uh, I'll now make some... Mary protested to Jesus Christ that he ought to change his ways and come into harmony with the scribes and the Pharisees. Now this means, of course, that Jesus Christ was very much alone in his battle against the pressures brought to bear upon him back there 
And when one thinks of the enormous pressure brought to bear upon him, one wonders how he possibly could have survived as a child. You think, for instance, of the awesome weight of the scribes and the rabbis, supported by the brothers of Jesus, supported in turn by the Pharisees, the all-powerful force in the land of Israel, and lacking backing from his own mother and father, who were not able to understand the real nature of his mission. Jesus Christ was different, and that difference was produced because of his own study and because God was in fact his father. And when, we, when we begin to appreciate the fact there was Christ's divine uh, teacher who really made him what he was, then we as parents will desire that the same divine teacher will be the teacher of our children as well. And when we come together in a few minutes' time to uh, again study the, the story before us, I'll be making some strong points in regard to God being our teacher and the necessity of that if, we, if our children are to grow in grace that we desire that they shall. This is an extremely important element in the whole procedure and while we may have, while we may have thought up until this time that God was the teacher of our children, we realise of course that Satan in fact was their teacher as we put them into his kingdom. So right, we'll stop at that point and uh, pick up the thread again in about 20 minutes time.